I, uh, you know, during the, during, during the Christmas season, the Klein household parties like rock stars. <laughs> we partied Thursday, Jess's family. We partied Friday, my family. We partied Saturday, the kids. And then on Sunday, we did the Klein thing. Went to dad's house. Like rock stars. I mean, we celebrated Christmas like nobody's business. And we ate, and we ate, and we ate. I don't know what it is about Christians when you get together, but all we do is eat. That's right. Gotta have food, baby. Do you know what, though? I love spending time with my family. I love spending time with my church family. I love spending time with the kids. I love spending time with my parents. I love spend, It's just a fantastic time of year. Yep. But have you ever been in one of these situations to where you're sitting in the room and the people tend to disengage? Anybody ever have that? Like one time, one of my kids, and, and, and I'm not going to say that child's name because I won't embarrass them. None sitting here. These are, these, these are the good ones. These are the good ones. These are the good ones. None sitting here. Definitely the good ones. But one of my other sons, as I was having a conversation with him, and this didn't happen recently. He was younger, but... You know, when I was having a conversation with him, in the middle of the conversation, he begins to rise the phone to his face. Uh-huh. And he's like, it was like slow motion. I'm like, I'm like, son, I'm still talking to you. And he's like, yeah, well, I don't care. <laughs> so it was, it's been one of those things, and this is just my conviction in our household. We just kind of, when we start to party and have a good time with Christmas and all things that we do, you know what, I, I try to, like, you know, Put the phone aside and things like that. But you know what? On the third day of partying, you know what I found myself doing? Playing on my phone. Bad Pastor Steve, right? And I don't know if you guys were here when I did that message about, uh, about my uh, son being in uh, a computer science degree and that he actually spends time it was one of his classes that he had to do, and he actually had to spend time writing uh, an algorithm that would engage you while you're on social media. And the purpose is if he could engage you long enough, what happens? Then that website gets paid. That's right. Right? Do you guys remember that? You remember that? Yeah. So I started talking to him about it, and I says, Dad, no matter, I mean, son, no matter how I, how many times I, uh, I'm in these, these situations, sometimes I just can't help myself, but I, I find something funny, I'm like, hee, 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 and then I want to find something else funny, right? And I scroll, and I go, hee, 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 and then I find myself, hee, 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 for like 20 minutes. Like, I get, I get caught in this loop. And I was talking to him about it again, and I'm like, you know, I fell into that trap again. And he's like, well, Dad, it's, it's not your fault. I'm like, oh, fantastic, I love that. I love the thought that's not my fault. You know what he says to me? He says, well, you know, every time you're searching like that, it's just proven scientifically that when you find something, you get this shot of dopamine in your brain, and it's released. And then it's about the seeking, not necessarily the finding. Does that make sense? And he says, you just have to, sometimes you just have to unplug. You know, and he's, he's 24, and he's teaching me something, I guess, right? I told him when I grow up, I want to be more like you, son. Do you know? That's what, I, that's what I did. But I found myself on Sunday in a conversation with my father. And we began to talk about these things. And, you know, it's just general table talk. And he says to me, do you think God ever kind of feels this way? You know, we're 
in the room, but are we connected? Does that make sense? Like the entire conversation with one of my other sons was, is, 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 is am I present in the moment with you? And then my father and I began this big, huge debate. He's like, God inhabits his people. I says, yes, but just because I'm sitting in a room doesn't mean I'm talking to you. Doesn't mean I'm connecting with you. Does that make sense? And, and this is just me. I'm just evaluating me. And I know the younger generation, they connect differently than my generation does, and that's fantastic. You know, and I'm not calling anybody out. This is just my personal convictions. But I, I want to be present in the moment. Does that make sense? And I want you, if you can, pull up uh, Galatians 5, 22, 23, please. But what is the evidence of connection in a believer's life? This is where I'm going in the morning. You know, you know I always segue like this. Come on. Yeah. Don't give me the jaw drop. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, what, what is the evidence of connection in a Jesus believer's life? Ah, oh, you read the scripture. No. That's okay. No, no, put it back up there. <laughs> the way we love on each other. The way we spend time with each other, right? So what is the evidence of the believer's life? The evidence of the believer's life is that our lives bear Let's say it again, that our lives bear much fruit, fruit. Hey, man, I'm, I'm just happy with one fruit sometimes, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, I've had conversations with some of my friends. You, you, you can just leave it up there. I've had conversations with some of my friends. You know, could someone build a case against you that you were actually a believer? Yes. If you walked into the court of law, it, is there... Is there enough evidence to say you are a Jesus follower? It's, it's rhetorical. Please don't answer. Okay? But that's my question to you. That's my question. Do we have connection? We might be inhabiting the space, but are we connecting within the space? Just some questions. You know, I'm going to go to the book of Galatians. Galatians is such a hard book because I really think you need to understand the theme of the book. You need to understand the issues that are going on within that providence or within that church for you to fully understand verses that are at the end of the letter. But I'm going to preface this a little bit. And listen, I'm not trying to bore you. I'm trying to inform you. It's going to be one of the messages, people. Buckle up, buttercup. Here I come. Here I come. Okay? So, there are two things happening in the church of Galatia. One, it's this thing called salvation by works. We know that salvation and that Jesus is a gift. All we have to do is receive it. But in that church... They were fighting the issue of salvation by works. I have to earn this. No, Jesus did it all. You don't have to earn a thing. And this is what they call the incident at Jerusalem, highlighted in the beginning of chapter 2. The other issue, which, listen, the, front, the, the beginning of Galatians deals with that. This is where we get fantastic verses like, don't frustrate the grace of God. Or what Christ did is in vain. This is where we get these verses from. It's salvation by works. But at the end of the book, he starts talking about spirituality by works. Or let's rephrase this so we understand it. Connection to God by works. What? He talks about an incident at Antioch. Now there's this incident at Antioch. Now there are two Listen, you go through Acts, and the reality is you're going to come across the name of two apostles or two Christian leaders. One's name is Peter, and the other's name is Paul. Are we familiar with these two apostles? Yes. These are two Christian leaders. Do you know what happens? 
in Antioch, they get into an argument. Now, this isn't any argument. This is a serious argument. This is like Mike Tyson and Holyfield stepping into the ring argument. This is not just a slight argument. This would be like Pastor Jerry and Pastor Rose and all of us coming up here and just yelling at each other for an hour. We would get your attention, wouldn't we? That's what this is like. You've got two apostles who had great relationship with Jesus. They had the power of God working through their life. They've raised people from the dead. And they end up and they end up in the place where Christianity blossomed and formed in Antioch, and they end up in a fight. What are they fighting over? Spirituality by works. This is what they are arguing about. The, you know, in my life, I've always, every time I've read the Bible, I've always put myself in the feet of Peter because he was such a knucklehead. I know, I love Peter. Right? But you would think him walking with Jesus all those years, he would have gotten an understanding. But here's what he's doing he's shunning people because they're not following the law. Paul challenges him. Paul challenges what it, when you've started something in the spirit, why are you going to end it in the flesh? Chapter 3 of Galatians. He's challenging him. My man Peter was becoming a legalist. Shame on you, Peter. Now listen, <laughs> he repented. He repented. But the entire end of Galatians is dedicated to legalism, spirituality, or connecting to God through works. Even though we're in the room, we're inhabiting the room, are we truly connecting? Just give me a list of rules. All I got to do is come into church and give money and sing a song and listen to the pastor. And I have a relationship with God. Not true. That's our form of legalism. Just throwing it out there. So I'm going to read this. Go ahead and leave, this, leave the scripture there. But I'm going to read this passage to you. Okay? I say then, walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is connection with God. And you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's what I want to do. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. For the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, adultery, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, And the likes of these I will tell you beforehand. Just as I have also told you in past times, those who practice these will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what does that mean? We're talking about spirituality by works. We're talking about connection to God. Are we saying that these things are the evident things in your life that ultimately says that, you know what, you will not go to heaven? We had, is that what he said? It's a possibility. But here's what I'm going to tell you. This is not the issue that we're dealing with in the last three chapters. This could have that meaning. But what I'm going to tell you is this. One, do I need an inheritance when I come face to face with Jesus? Do I need the fruit of the Spirit when I come face? Do I need that connection once I come face to face with Jesus? No, I'm already in His presence. I'm already in his presence. So what, what is it that we are failing to inherit? I will challenge you in your thought process that inheritance is for here and for now. Inheritance is for here and for now. What is the kingdom of God? Is it a destination? Where is the kingdom of God? 
We liken it as to kingdom of God is just heaven, but I'm going to tell you right now, you are the kingdom of God right now. He says, I am the light of the world, the cosmos. You are the kingdom. Where you go, you take his power and you take his presence with you. I need an inheritance to show the kingdom now. Are you following me? Are you tracking? Paul says, walk according to the Spirit. To the Spirit. This is what we need to have true connection. Remember, if it was a heaven, if he's dealing with a heaven and hell issue, I think you would adjust it in the first three chapters. But he's addressing spirituality, which was at Antioch. If I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that he's been raised from the dead, you shall be saved. What part of that has to do with my performance? So the the question is this, how do we become mature? How do we continue to have connection? We see the things that we we should not do to disinherit. But what must we do to walk or what must we do to become mature and to inherit? Walk by the Spirit. I would like you to pull this one up. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, please. And oh my, it's 10 to 12 and I haven't even made it to my intro yet. I ain't made it to my intro yet. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal and as babes in Christ. What's he saying here? This is his opening verse. It's verse 1. What's he saying? I can't talk to you as people who walk by the Spirit or are spiritual, who have a spiritual connection to God. I have to talk to you as people of the flesh or carnal who operate in the five senses. And he refers to people like this as babies. Here's the good news. How does he finish it? In Christ. So it is a heaven and hell issue? Or is it a connection issue? It's a connection issue. I fed you with the milk and not the with solid food. But until now you were not able to receive, or even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, you are carnal and behaving like mere men. So he gives this, he gives these three things that happen, and he's talking to a church, right? He's talking to a group of people. He says, where there's envy, strife, and division, guess what? Indicator of carnality. And listen, the Corinthian church had much deeper issues. And Paul (laughs) brings out these three things which are within the church. Do we envy? Do we strife? Do we have division? Then guess what? We're walking in carnality. Okay, ready? Repeat after me. Pastor Pastor Steve loves me. That's right. I love you. I want to teach you. I want to train you. But if you practice yielding to your own desires, we are carnal. And we disinherit the things that God would have for us. We let the enemy come in and steal our inheritance. Which causes us to disinherit. Why do we even need an inheritance? Why do we need to inherit from here and now? Guess what? The world deserves a better witness than the church shows. The world, Pastor Rose, (laughs) she pulled this out of me one day, and it's been one of these things that she repeated, and then it just stuck into my brain. The world deserves a better witness. Hmm. Now, I want to finish. I'm going to jump to the, to the end of the chapter in Corinthians. And then we're going to go through a lot of scripture today, baby. I told you, buckle up. This is the beginning of one of my, my series. Is. So guess what? It's going to be big. All right. Okay? Here we go. 
For no other foundations can anyone lay that which is laid. This is 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, if you can pull that up. Which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's works will become clear. Let's pause for a minute. For each one's works. What do you think the works are? There are, diff- there, there are a variety of works here. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. But what is your works? As a believer, as somebody who loves Jesus, guess what? Your works are the fruit of your life. Fruit of your life. For the day will... For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work and what sort it is. Not how big it is, Christian leaders, what sort it is, the quality of it. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Ah, let's pause at the word reward for a minute. Far different than an inheritance. A reward is something that you receive for your good works. Works done by faith. Are you following? Are you tracking? I'm trying to show you a difference. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. For he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Our reward comes when we come face to face with Jesus in an afterlife. Our inheritance and the things that we need to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit come now. Connection, connection, connection. And he says this, if your works of wood, hay, and straw, guess what happens? The fire burns those. But he still states at the end, you are saved, yet as through fire. He's still talking about the carnality. Your carnality produces wood, hay, and stubble and is burnt by fire, which means it's not lasting. There's no reward. Are you with me? Oh, I know. It's kind of rough. I know. I'm still building, though. Here's the good news. I want to, I want to put this verse out here, and I just love this verse. I just love this verse. You know what? I want to grab Lukey. Come here, Luke. I want Luke and I want Emma. Come here, Luke and Emma. Come here. Come here, Luke and Emma. I just want you to sit right here and lay back. Okay? Sit and lay back. Yep, just lay back. Yep. Uh, Now. Don't move. Okay. So, there's a scripture in Ephesians that goes like this. And let me get it right. Let me get it right. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. What's he saying? There are those who are alive masquerading as if they are dead. But he says, to come alive, to come awake. If I were to walk into a morgue, and I seen two bodies laying there, How would I ever tell which one was dead? But Paul's command is to come out from amongst the dead. Come out from amongst the dead. You can get up too. You can get up too. But I want you to still think that Emma's still laying there. Okay? Come out from amongst the dead. This is the difference between being carnal and walking by the Spirit. I have come out from amongst the dead. You remember those manifestations of the flesh we talked about? Whatever they were, they, they were a bunch of list of different sins. Yep, lots of them. If the believer masquerades as someone who's constantly sinning, how can you tell the difference? Amen. Amen. I'm called to come out from amongst the dead. I'm called to be a better witness. Are you with me? Are you tracking? All right. Okay. All right. That's my, that's my, that's my dead analogy. Yeah, give him a hand. He... 
He's so good. He's such a good kid. Such a good kid. So let's go back to Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithness, faithness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, such things. There is no law. We weren't meant to fulfill this by the law, but by the Spirit. So here's the question. How do we live, love, and look like Jesus? Fruit. What do people see? Mm, I like it. Love. What do they see? They see your fruit. So why do we need to live like this? The world deserves a better witness. To be the light. I love it. You know, there was a... Uh, an India social reformist, and his name was Gandhi. And he said this, I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike Christ. Translation, I'd have became a Christian if I could have ever found one. I know, I know, buckle up, buttercup. I told you. I told you. I told you. God's highest purpose for the Christian is to make us like Jesus. It's not heaven and hell. His highest purpose. And I'm walking in my own desires and whatever Steve wants to do, guess what? I'm disinheriting. But when I'm walking in true connection with God, I am Inheriting. I am inheriting the fruits. Romans 8.29 says this. For God knew his people in advance. And he chose them to become like his son. I really don't want to go any farther. I'm going to read the rest of it to you. So that his son would be the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. Let's do it again. He chose him to become like his son. What do the fruits do? Give us the ability to look like his son. Nothing attracts people, believers, unbelievers alike, than seeing a life lived out in love, joy, peace. Make sense? But nothing detracts or removes from the integrity and effectiveness of the message of the gospel than a life contrary to the life of Christ. Hmm. Here's the good news. <laughs> Got some good news for you. We are given that opportunity. We all have the power and the presence of God in connection and in relationship with Him within us. We have this potential, potential. Pastor Jerry talked about a, 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 a people that he comes across that kind of rub you the wrong way. What do you call those people? <laughs> that message still holds true, bro. Still holds true, pops. Sandpaper people. That's right now. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now, your mind's rolling. Somebody that just rubs you the wrong way. You work with them. Hopefully you're not married to them. Not me. But guess what? Everybody you come in contact with eventually will rub you the wrong way. And you've got the potential and the ability to show them the Jesus that is within you. Amen. You know, when I worked out at the mill, I had a guy who, who would cuss at me in paragraph form and made sense. I mean, this cat would not come out of my grill, would not leave me alone. Do you know why? Because I claim Jesus. And the moment I started claiming Jesus, he came after me. He, came, he, he, he wanted to test me. 
He wanted to irritate me. He did things to get under my skin. He would disable machinery and make me have to fix it. He cut the I'm telling you, he cut the copper out of the wire and just put the plastic under a terminal. And when you've got 1,500 wires in a, in a cabinet, that's a long trace. And the heat and the sweat and the, and the noise of the, of, the, of the mill. But guess what? Did not give me the right to retaliate. Because guess what? If I'd have retaliated, I would have lost my witness. Scripture says this, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. We are never, ever to attack people. We show them the love of God, even if it hurts, even if it's killing us. I have no right. I gave up that right. What if Jesus wanted to invoke his rights on the cross? I don't deserve this. I'm just going to come on down. Hmm. You know, I know Scripture tells us, right, we, we overcome evil with more evil, right? Oh, there's, you mean that's not, that's not the verse? Oh, so, so what is the verse? Oh, we overcome evil with good. Not a very popular verse, though, is it? Love is not tested with the people you like. Love is not tested. I'm, woo, you missed the... A, 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 a place to amen. Love is not tested with the people that you like. Oh, you guys, fantastic. That's good. Oh. But listen, the developing of the fruit and the connection to Jesus in your life is essential to showing and manifesting his nature. Fruit we talked about this, is an indicator in your life, right? Jesus says in John 15, 4, Abide in me, and I in All the branches cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me, live in, dwell in, connect with. Put my distraction down. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me bears much fruit. Not a little bit, much fruit. No, much fruit. <laughs> For without me, you can do nothing. Oh, can you believe that? Or is your pride in a way? So listen, I'm going to give you a couple key concepts before we move on because I really want to get it. Listen, this is my intro. Calm down. It's going to get better. Here we go. <laughs> Important keys in cooperating with fruit bearing. What happens in the fruit bearing process? How do I bear the fruit of the Spirit, the connection to Jesus in my life that makes somebody attracted to the Jesus within me? Don't be mm, that's, that's step two. Don't get out of yourself. <laughs> We've got to be receptive. Receptive. Receptive to Jesus. Receptive what's going on. Receptive to hearing. I always ask people all the time, are you open? Are you open? Are you open into having a conversation? Is your... Is, is, oh, he's tired. That's okay. <laughs> are, are you open? Think about it for a minute. How can you have a conversation with somebody and fruit bearing if they're not open? If they're not ready to realize, if they're not ready to have a conversation with you on a personal, intimate level. Are you open? Are you receptive? Here we go. Pruning. When God is talking to you, you know what I mean? Like, I just call it the moments of stupid Steve. Like, I have... Seriously stupid moments that happen in my life. And I'm like, that was the dumbest thing I've ever thought. And that was the second dumbest thing I've ever said. I can't believe my mouth followed my mind. Right? And there's moments in your life when God is going to speak to you and go, eh, 
Really? It's not quite like my son. If you want to work on it, let's talk. And God is cool like that. He'll talk to you about in those moments. But what happens when you hold your hand up? I don't want to. What's he do? He doesn't beat you on it. He just kind of, Pastor Rose, right? He, he just kind of subsides and he'll bring the conversation up maybe when you are at a place where you are open, right? We're supposed to stay connected. Amen. Stay connected. What happens when God starts talking to you? Let's just put it into the church culture and the church community. You know what happens? I don't see somebody for like three weeks in church. And I'm like, oh, God's talking to them. What do they do? They lose connection. They want to step out. They go, oh, that's not quite right. You know, when I used to, and this, this doesn't happen to me now. I had to start getting over this. But when I first started reading the Bible and I was just like, all right, Lord, and look, God started talking to me about something, I just close it because I figured if I didn't know it, I didn't have to do it. Right? Emma, don't take all of my, yeah. <laughs> she's, like, she's like, no, Pastor Steve, that's wrong. Listen, you can learn from my stupid, you know? But do you see my point to you? I just closed the Bible. I was like, nope, no, I'm sorry. Deal with it later. But then guess what? When I was open, he come knocking again. Right? He come knocking again. That's what I'm here to tell you. The fruit of the Spirit is evidence of unbroken connection and friendship. I want you to wrap your mind around. We use this fancy Christian word called fellowship. It's the fellowship of the Christians. But the reality is, what is it? It's friendship. It's communication. Right? It's connection. Right? You know, we look at the life of Jesus, and let's go back to this statement. Ready? Let's go back to this statement. I want, I want to go back to this statement. The statement goes like this. The world deserves a better So how did Jesus do this? To me, he had two approaches. Oh, 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 oh you let me answer this one? Okay. He did it through two, two, two ways. They both came by the Spirit. Ready? He did it by the fruit of the Spirit. And he did it by the gifts of the Spirit. Let me say it again. Fruit of the Spirit and gifts. The fruit of the Spirit represents what? Character. Character. It's the character of Christ that is within me that makes Jesus attractive. Right? And then there's the gifts or the power. How many people did he come across and he just healed them all and delivered them all, right? So he had this perfect mesh of character and power. Hmm. So, and, 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 let's, and let's just talk about how many there were. Does anybody know how many... Okay, the scripture's not up there. <laughs> How many fruit of the Spirit is there? Oh, you little geniuses. Okay. How many gifts of the Spirit are there? Nah, you little geniuses. What does that mean? Perfect balance of character and power. Woo. We're supposed to be in balance. We're not supposed to run from meeting to meeting to meeting, looking for power. We're supposed to develop our character. And all these things will follow. Oh, I know, I know. I'm going to duck. Here's the problem. Most Christians think the evidence of Jesus in their life is power. But I'm going to tell you right now, the evidence of Jesus in your life is character. Amen. It's character. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 concludes like this. Earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. So in this, okay, this is the conclusion of the chapter. And in chapter 12, he talks about the nine 
gifts or the power. Then he turns around, the Apostle Paul says, but yet I'm going to show you a more excellent way. What does that mean? Better way? More effective way? What, 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 what follows? What follows chapter 12? What happens in chapter 13? It's the love. <laughs> Bankruptcy. So the more excellent way is love. Well, all, then all the power, healing, deliverance, prophecy, all these fantastic things of power. And he says what? I would rather you love. Why? 1 John 4, 8 says this. He doesn't say the God of love. He says God is love. It's his nature. It's his core. It's his essence. It's who he is. If you know him at all, you understand this. You understand this. It's the fruit of love. And we look, listen, we look at the fruit of the Spirit and we think that Love is just one aspect. I'm going to challenge you in that it's all aspects. It's all fruit. It's all encompassing. Let's go back to Galatians 22, 23 for a minute. Well, I'll just, I'll just, for the sake of time. But the fruit of the Spirit is. Which means it's singular in nature. If not, the scripture would have said are. Plural. It is. So now here we talk about the power, the gifts, and we translate into love. And here's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that love encompasses all of the fruit. Ready? Give me 1 Corinthians 4. Or 13, 4 through 8, please. <laughs> love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not be behave itself rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in, in, in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Let's just, we're just going to stop right there. Love suffers long. What fruit do you think that is? Patience, right? Long suffering and patience. The very key to inheriting anything on this earth from heaven. Patience. You can't eat your fruit. Or maybe eat your seed. Okay? Don't eat your seed. Plant it. Right? You've got to be patient. And is kind. Kindness. The kindness of God is merciful. Kindness draws people to God. And he only sees that in and through your kindness. Why do we distribute food? Kindness. To draw people. To show them something different. Love does not envy. When you have envy, what do you have? Lack of peace. Envy and strife, right? It's lack of peace. The loss of peace takes us out of harmony with the people around us and with God. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. This is gentleness or meekness. It's noble. It's gentle. It's humble. More importantly, meekness is teachable. Does not behave rudely, is not provoked. Self-control and peace. Self-control with our appetites of our own desires. Peace, once again. Does not seek its own, thinks no evil. It's goodness. It's virtuous. I'm going to tell you right now, goodness is the fruit of righteousness. They're almost the same thing. It's Goodness is, is, is a state of being. Goodness and kindness actually work together. Joy. We see joy in this one. Joy is something that's internal, and it's a strength. 
The things around me do not create my happiness. Joy is internal. Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him. We don't even understand joy. That was his reward in heaven, joy in you. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, adores all things. It's patient. It's faithful. And it's faithfulness. It's not faith. The word's fidelity, which means, guess what? The ability just to show up. Amen. Show up. Be where you're supposed to be. Do what you're supposed to do, right? Love never fails. Against such things there is no law. Love never fails. It's all encompassing. Love is the fruit. Love is the fruit. Right? God, he gives us two commands. What are they? Love God and love people. He sums up the entire New Testament with two, with two commands. Love God, love people. And here's the reality. He says this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart. Come on. So you're getting there. You're getting there. All your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? It seems like that's, I mean, let's get real for a minute. Doesn't that seem kind of impossible? That's why you can't do it on your own, right? To love God with everything within you kind of seems a little bit impossible. But how many know when Jesus walked this earth, he prayed over his disciples? You know what he said? He says, I have revealed to them, and I will continue to do so, that your love for me, God, will be in them. That your love for me will be in them. He, how many people know Jesus got his prayers answered? Hello? 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 Right? That the love of God is in you. It's there. But the fruit of the Spirit is not some checklist. That you're like, I got love. I got peace today. I got peace. It's not a checklist. It's a connection. Then he says, love people. Second command, I says to love people. This is where the fruit of the Spirit is needed. Because, man, I got people going to rub you the wrong way. And as... Jesus believers, we do not have the right to manifest self or we disinherit. 